From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. President Biden delivers a speech in Israel and blames a misfired rocket for an explosion at a hospital in Gaza as Congressman Jim Jordan fails a second time to be elected Speaker of the House. Welcome. I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Bill McGurn and editorial board member Kate Batchelder odell Biden on Wednesday was in Israel meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and some of the victims of the Hamas terrorism. He said that the terrorist attacks on Israel amounted to 15 9-11s and gave a speech in Tel Aviv. This is a piece of what he said. Long said, if Israel didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. While it may not feel that way today, Israel must again be a safe place for the Jewish people. And I promise you, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that it will be. 75 years ago, just 11 minutes after its founding, President Harry S. Truman and the United States of America became the first nation to recognize Israel. We've stood by your side ever since. We're going to stand by your side now. Bill, what did you make of the speech there from President Biden, both as a matter of presidential rhetoric and also the substance of his message to Israel and the world? Well, insofar as it goes, I thought it was fine. President Biden loves using the moral language to talk about right and wrong and so forth. In this case, to reaffirm Israel's right to exist and defend itself. And there was a lot of good stuff on that. But there was also, as usual, missing from it is um, any talk about Iran and very few specifics. For example, the two areas he talked about were for other countries who are thinking about taking advantage of the situation. He just said, don't. And he talked about the humanitarian aid going into Gaza, and he warned Hamas not to steal it. But really, with very little report of consequence. For example, with the aid, he just said it would stop. So Hamas has no incentive not to steal it. All it means is the Palestinian people, whom they don't care about, won't get the aid. They wouldn't get it if Hamas is stealing it anyway. So I was a little disappointed that I think what remains to be seen is whether Joe Biden can take the tough decisions that are going to come down the line when other bad actors try to get into this conflict or go the U.S. into taking a bit more position, try to attack us or something. And I think it's fraught with all that. He's lucky right now that Israel is taking the lead. They are better versed in what needs to be done. It's on their home territory. And as long as he supports them, they can take most of the tough decisions. But I think I'm a little shakier on down the road. Kate, was there anything else that jumped out at you from President Biden's speech? Well, I thought to Bill's point that it did state the moral stakes rather plainly and make an effort to enter into the grief and trauma that the Israelis have experienced. And also the heroic actions that day of, for instance, a retired general driving down to try to help save folks and now to see all over the world folks coming back to Israel to be called up for reserve duty. So I think he did capture some of the moment well. And to Bill's point, that's important. And it may seem to us that the moral stakes are so obvious, but a portion of the president's party is pushing him to abandon Israel. So it's not nothing for him to make those plain spoken remarks in Israel's defense. And I think he deserves credit for it. Now, I also thought one good sign was commitment to keep military aid coming to Israel and helping For instance, keep Iron Dome fresh with rockets, with interceptors to shoot down Hamas rockets. That is one place where the U.S. can be very helpful and we share technology and ability to produce those interceptors. And we also, by the way, the U.S. Army has two Iron Dome batteries in its stocks that the Army has really never found a great purpose for. So that's one thing I've been pushing for to get those transferred back to Israel along with whatever interceptors that the army bought with them. But that is a good sign to see that the Biden administration is committed to keeping that military aid flowing, which is a longstanding U.S. commitment to Israel. So those, I think, were two important aspects of the speech. He will likely ask Congress for a large funding package that will include probably Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel. 
But I think it's a sign of his commitment to helping them militarily. And it's something, like I said, in today's Democratic Party that can't be taken for granted. But on the flip side of the equation is what Bill said is the open question of how the U.S. will respond if, for instance, Hezbollah will open a second front on the northern border of Israel. We haven't seen, we've seen some volleys so far, some skirmishes, but nothing major. And Biden has flowed huge amounts of U.S. military force into the region. One carrier strike group, the USS Gerald Ford on station, and then another one that has extended that deployment on the Ford and will be joined by the USS Eisenhower. And its strike group also moved Air Force assets into the region and a Marine expeditionary force to potentially help with evacuations. I mean, this is a real testament to America's ability to show up on the global scene very quickly. And it should make any potential adversary think very seriously about bringing any of those assets to bear on them in response if they do what the president said, don't, 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 don't get involved. But I think the really uncomfortable question is to what extent Biden is prepared to respond if Hezbollah does open a second front or if Iran continues to threaten to get involved or makes good on that in some way. I think that is where the job gets much tougher for the president. A couple of additional points on what's happening on the ground there in Gaza and Israel. But let's set those up with another clip from President Biden. Palestinian people are suffering greatly as well. We mourn the loss of innocent Palestinian lives like the entire world. I was outraged and saddened by the enormous loss of life yesterday in the hospital in Gaza. Based on the information we've seen to date, it appears the result of an errant rocket fired by a terrorist group in Gaza. The United States unequivocally stands for the protection of civilian life during conflict. And I grieve, I truly grieve for the families who were killed or wounded by this tragedy. The people of Gaza need food, water, medicine, shelter. Today, I asked the Israeli cabinet, who I met with for some time this morning, to agree to the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza. Bill, one report that I'm seeing is that President Biden is talking about $100 million in aid going into Gaza, which is surrounded by Israel and also has another border with Egypt. But to the point that you made earlier on where that aid ultimately ends up, the journal has an editorial in today's paper on some reports that international humanitarian aid that was managed by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees was stolen. And there are reports from Israeli news sources, Israel's military liaison, that 24,000 liters of fuel and also medical supplies were stolen from the UN, from a warehouse there, and taken to Hamas. And that's the danger. I don't doubt that humanitarian aid is needed for civilians in Gaza. But the question is always how much of that ends up turned toward the Hamas war effort. Yeah, let's face it. Hamas is in control in Gaza. And I don't think you're going to get a lot of aid past them if they want to take it. And that's what I find a little disingenuous. You know, we say there'll be consequences, but the only consequence, he says, is we'll stop doing it. Probably a good thing, but it means Hamas really faces no risk for stealing it. All that'll happen is that the aid will dry up, but they'll have got what they can get while they could get it. So it's the kind of thing I worry about Joe Biden. A lot of his stuff is based on don't do this or else. And you're left wondering what our else is. Look, compared to Donald Trump, he didn't have, in my view, the best policy, but he killed an Iranian general, got their attention after they killed an American. And I think people wondered what nor else meant. With Joe Biden, we have this horrible pullout from Afghanistan, a half-hearted commitment to Ukraine, where he won't talk about Ukrainian victory. So I just wonder, I think what it means somewhere, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow or next month, but somewhere in the next few months, it's going to be tested. There are all sorts of bad actors out in the Middle East, and a lot of them are going to test the president, and they're going to try to take advantage of the chaos and see if he really means what he says. And I hope he does. I think we all have to pray that Joe Biden is as good as his word here. But I think there's a lot of reason to worry. 
The other piece of news from the president was weighing in on this disputed explosion at a hospital in Gaza. The first reports that came on Tuesday saying authorities there were claiming that it was a result of an Israeli airstrike on the hospital and that hundreds had been killed. Israel quickly pushed back on that, saying that according to their information, it had been a malfunctioning or misfired rocket from Palestinian Islamic Jihad, one of the groups in Gaza, and it was a rocket presumably aimed at Israel that did not hit its target, did not get out of Gaza. And so, Kate, obviously notable that the United States is weighing in there and saying, according to the evidence that the U.S. has reviewed, they believe the source of this explosion was not at all an Israeli airstrike, but it was indeed some sort of failed attack on Israel that fell short of where it was intended to go. Yeah, I think the president deserves credit for lending the U.S. intelligence premature to the reality of what happened there. And I think that gives it an added credibility because this story about 500 dead at a hospital because of an Israeli airstrike, I mean, it was all over the internet and it seems to have clearly spurned some protests abroad at uh, U.S. embassies and the like. And we now are seeing evidence that it has no basis in fact, either on who caused it or what the damage was. It became very clear Today, that, for instance, the damage around the hospital area was simply just not consistent with either the number dead. Now, of course, dozens of people surely died. We don't want to mitigate that in any way. But the damage profile did not fit an airstrike. It did not fit a casualty event of the magnitude that Hamas was describing. So we know now better of what what happened. But the damage, to some extent, has been done. You had Democratic politicians in Congress repeat the claim that it was an Israeli airstrike who has, as of this recording, um, have not walked back the claim that they stand corrected now or have better information. So this is a case where taking Hamas at its word has real consequences. Uh, You know, Hamas has the Ministry of Health and these other outfits that are trying to be a conceit for being a real government, but it's a terrorist organization that is putting out information to shape the battlefield environment to their advantage. And that's, I think, something that every journalist should remember when trying to work through the fog of real-time information of war. (laughs) 